to you from the Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. My asthma's kind of bad tonight, so we might do just about anything. <laughs> we're not too sure what we're going to do. If I lose my voice, an audience is going to take over. They don't know that yet, but I got two brothers that teach. They ought to know a lot of stuff. And, and I got all the people from Louisiana. And, and where are you from? New Jersey. New Jersey. And where else somebody from? Ohio. Ohio, my own state. How can I forget that? <laughs> Well, we're going to talk again. Last, last uh, Tuesday, we had a great show on fear. Well, we're going to talk about fear again. But before, you know, everybody has fears. You know, everybody's got a fear. I'm going to read you this, this wonderful song. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. But what does that mean, I lack nothing? Well, we all kind of lack something, don't we? Do you think you all lack something? How many of you think you lack something? Only one, oh, come on, you all lack something. Oh, come on, we're both at there you go. We all lack something. But this psalm says, he is my shepherd. I lack nothing. You know what it means? It means, if the Lord is my shepherd, I have perfect trust and perfect confidence that even if I lack something I think I need, or maybe I really need, it's okay. See, a lot of times we lack things, but there's no use to get bitter or angry. See, we have to stop th start thinking with a, another, hey, my voice is coming back with another kind of um, thought. We have to have a whole other thought. We just can't think these lower thoughts of the world. We got to put a, a higher and a heavenly and spiritual reason for everything that happens. In my soul then, this is what it's talking about. No matter what I lack exteriorly, my soul lacks nothing because he is my shepherd. The government isn't my shepherd. The politicians are not my shepherds. The only shepherd I have is Jesus. He is the shepherd. He is the Messiah. In our gospel this morning at Mass, it said that there were many messiahs and many Christ coming. Don't believe them. Some of you believe every new Christ, every new prophet, every new cult, every new new age crazy thing that can be possible, don't even make any sense. And you just grab onto it. And it's, it, it isn't even a bubble, it's a nothing. There's only one shepherd, one Lord, one God, one Savior. That's Jesus. In meadows of green grass, he lets me lie. To the waters of repose, he leads me. There he revives my soul. That's prayer. When you have fears, do you pray? 
I wonder what we pray for when you have a fear. Pray to get rid of the fear, right? But you know there are healthy fears. You have to have a fear that if you go through a red light, you're going to be hit head on. Isn't that a good fear? You have to have a healthy fear that if you're 95 years old, you shouldn't get on ice skates. <laughs> You know, one time I saw a lady, I've said this a couple of times on the air, maybe some of you did hear it. So Sister Regina and I were going down the mall one time, and you know what I'm going to say, don't you? <laughs> this old gal walking down there in mini shorts, I mean short shorts. She must have been 80, 85. <laughs> I said to Regina, do you see what I see? She said, yeah. I said, I don't know what she expects to happen, but I bet it doesn't. <laughs> I never, <laughs> if I had legs like that, I'd put them in a box or something. <laughs> Why'd I get on that subject? <laughs> well, see, people go after the wrong things. They're lonely. They don't go to God. What bothers me if all those people have one foot in the grave already, and they still go for these material things to make them happy. See, we, we don't go to the waters of repose, the soul, the prayer, that he can revive my soul. Why don't you, when you have a fear, and I don't care what it is, well, that fear has to be given to God. You have to get rid of it. Now, don't forget to call. See, it's as though I pass through a gloomy valley. I fear no harm. We've all had gloomy valleys. Haven't you in your life had a gloomy valley? We all got gloomy valleys. But she, it says here, though I pass through that, I don't, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna have any harm done to me. Beside me, your rod and staff are there to hearten me. What is his rod and staff? Faith and hope. That's my rod and my staff. I know he loves me. He created me for a reason. He put me on this show as asthma and Now, wouldn't you think he would take this away? Huh? Is, it, is this a place to have asthma? No. But is that my business? No. Do I have to worry if I'm going to get on the show and my asthma act up? Why should I worry? You've got to love me the way I am, asthma and all. I bet I'm about to wet my nose here with an ice cube. <laughs> I never understood ice cubes. They're always on the top when they should be on the bottom. <laughs> And every glass I ever drank out of, my nose got him before my mouth did. Somebody ought to, ought to invent an ice cube that stays on the bottom. Now, that's, that's a challenge for some inventor out there. You prepare a table for me under the eyes of my enemies. Oh, you know what happened? We had a martyr today for a bath. I mean, a martyr's feast. And the martyrs were great witnesses. Those people went into the arena. If you ever go to Italy, you can go to the Colosseum. And those people ran out into that, and they were praising God and singing hymns. See, we don't even have the faith today to defend the Eucharist or defend Jesus without running out in an arena praising God with a lion opening his mouth. Well. See, that's preparing a table in the eyes of our enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup brims over. Wow. See, if I have faith and hope and love for Jesus in the midst of fear, in the midst of darkness, 
in the midst of all the loneliness and the heartaches and whatever it is we have, if I can put all my trust in the Lord, what a great, great act of love that is for Jesus. We have a caller. Hello? Hello, Mother? Yeah, where are you from? I'm from Pennsylvania. And what is your fear? Beg pardon? What is your fear? Uh, this is what I, that I really fear for the church. Now, we have this decision on abortion. Yeah. Now, we had one justice on there who was a Catholic who voted with the majority. He's reputedly even had an award from for a, the St. Thomas More Society as an outstanding Catholic lawyer, yet he will vote to uphold Roe versus Wade. Now, this is just one small example. That's divisive in the church. Well, let me tell you, I think they're all chicken up there. Like that whole Supreme Court of chickens. They're more worried about men and fear of men than they are fear of God. It, it's, it's, it's frightening. You're right. It is absolutely frightening when the Supreme Court upholds killing, murder. Except says, hey, kid, you better tell your parents a couple of days ahead of time. That doesn't make any sense. You got to warn the doctor, warn this, you're still killing a baby. See, yeah, I, yeah, I fear too. I fear when our country goes against God. I fear when the Supreme Court upholds murder, just as long as you tell somebody ahead of time. They have no fear of the Lord country today and the whole world. When you lose faith and hope and love, you have no fear of the Lord. Which means, it doesn't mean I'm scared of your death. What it means is that I have a sense of justice, God's justice. Not my justice, not your justice. You have the will to choose, but there are some things you cannot choose, even though you have a will to choose it. You can't will to, to kill somebody. You can't will to starve somebody because you're tired taking care of them. That's not for you to will. You can't play God. Satan played God. And he's playing God today. And he has deceived even the Supreme Court. God have mercy on all of them. Yeah, I fear too. I fear the chastisement of God upon this country. For we fear men. We do not fear God. And one day, so many things will happen in this country. We will kneel one day and fear God and repent for this injustice to the unborn, unborn. You have every right to fear, but what do we do? We pray. Pray that somehow our country will come to its senses. You can give me all kind of reasons, all you Supreme Court judges, that why you did this or that. Give those reasons to the Lord God. See if he understands your reasoning. No, he doesn't. You will have to account, each one of you, for the murder of thousands and millions of babies. Sleep with that tonight. Well, I think we need to say a prayer right now for our country. 
We need to say the prayer for all the chicken-livered politicians in this country who will do anything for a vote. Yeah. I have the same fears as you have. But I pray also that God in his infinite mercy will look upon this country and by whatever means bring it back to repentance. For in a very short time they will begin to reason out why we should kill the poor, the street people, the old, the handicapped. Yeah. From one hardened sin comes another. Let's pray for them now. Dear Father, I offer you the precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of my beloved Son, a reparation for the sins of our Supreme Court in this nation, for all our sins and my sins, and the sins of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on them. Have mercy on us. And bring these aborted children quickly into your kingdom. They've never had a chance to live the life you wished them to have. Amen. We have another call. Hello? They're irritable? Huh? Yes. Hello. Where are you from? I'm from Louisiana. Good. We got a lot of them here. Do you have a fear? Do you have a fear? Yes. I... <laughs> what is it? What's your fear? Am I on? You're on. I'm from Louisiana. Okay. And I'm family. Good. And I have a fear of growing old. I have a sister that's 96 and not able to do anything. Mm. I'm 85. What is your, fi I, your fear? I, I thank you for your program. I watch it every night. Thank you. I think there's a normal fear of getting old. Um, and I think it's a, the most fear is when you find out you're old. <laughs> I mean, you see it coming, you know, as the years go by. <laughs> but you just pretend it's not there. And if you get a little gray hair, you use this uh, color stuff, you know. But you see, uh, it makes your good hair look darker and your gray hair look lighter. Somehow it don't work anyway. <laughs> Everybody knows, boy, she dye her hair. <laughs> so, um, and you get a little wrinkle here, but you cover it up with this paste, you see, you just go over there. <laughs> so by the time you get done, you look pretty good. But see, the next morning you wash it off, right there again. So it isn't like it's a surprise. We just hide it. Well, at some point you get the, you get the point. I think that that point is where your greatest fear is. I got a Golden Age magazine one time and I said, this is for old folks. What am I getting this thing for? And I, I thought, well, somebody was nice enough to send it to me. See, so I opened it up, and I was on the center page. <laughs> and I looked at that picture of me in the Golden Age magazine, which is for old folks, in case you didn't know. And I thought, by God, I made it. <laughs> <laughs> but that was OK. It was a tiny revelation. But I think there is a fear. I wouldn't fear the fear. 
I think it's normal. But at your age, I would hope you would begin to get very joyful and happy about it. You know? Because at some point, very easily, very lovingly, you will suddenly find yourself before Jesus. It's not a big deal, dying. You don't, you don't know when you fall asleep. Do you know when you fall asleep? Huh? Nobody knows when you fall asleep. You lay there, first thing you know, it's 8 o'clock in the morning. See? That's the way death is. And, and you're, you're there, and the first thing you see the most beautiful face in the whole wide world. You see a smile, unbelievable. You see a face that is filled with love and compassion. Something you've never seen before. Unbelievable. Why do you fear that? What do you think you're going to do when you die? Is going to be a big angel there with a big uh, weight, you know, and the devil's putting on some stuff, and your angel's putting on something, it's going this way. Nah, that's not death. I heard a vision of a mystic many years ago. Don't ask me who, because I don't remember. Is it true? I don't remember that. I don't know that either. So you all got that straight? I don't know who it was. <laughs> and I don't know if it's true. <laughs> you can make up your own mind. But this mystic said, it's about in the 50s, 40s or 50s, that she saw the judgment of Stalin and Mussolini. And the Lord supposedly said to Stalin, do you love me? I think he said, did you love me? And he said, no. He said, do you love me? And he said, no. He said, do you want to be with me? And he said, no. They turned away. Then she said, she saw the judgment of Mussolini. And the Lord said, did you love me? And he said, no. I said, do you love me? And he said, yes. Do you want to be with me? He said, yes. He didn't go straight to heaven. He may still be in purgatory, who knows? But it was just a judgment, do you love me? I don't know if it's true. Sounds pretty good though, don't it? Does that sound pretty good? Yes. Sounds logical. Sounds like something I would do. And didn't he do that to Peter? I mean, Peter had a big sin on his soul. A big sin. He denied his Lord. And what did he say three times? Do you love me? He said, yes, Lord. Do you love me? Yes, Lord. Feed my sheep. See? Don't be afraid anymore. I know you're old. <coughs> That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. But your soul is not old. See, that's the problem. That's why we fight old age, see? Our soul is young and vibrant, and our body <laughs> I tired it. Kaput. So what are you going to do about it? Your soul inside is alive and immortal. It's never going to die. See, that's what you think about. Don't worry about these old wrinkled bones and hands. And what, what, what does that matter? He's going to bring it back all new. Don't be afraid. We have another call. Hello? Yes, hello, Mother. Where are you from? Uh, Davis, California. Wonderful. My name's Rosemary. I'm calling. Go I'm ahead. Calling because... I used to be in Unity and New Age Movement, and I came back to the church about a year ago. Uh -huh. And my fear is that, like Peter, I would be in denial or betray my Lord and fall out of the church again. And uh, I don't, I don't want to do that. And yet, I feel like what, I've what been, makes you, what makes you think you will? Uh, I don't have a real good track record huh? of being faithful. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, but you're, you're praying for perseverance. 
see. Yes, I am, very much so. Good. So do I. And, and that fear is uh, that then I would not yeah. uh, <coughs> save my soul and mm -hmm. not witness to other people. Yeah. Well, I think it's a healthy fear to fear you might fall. It's not something, however, you should contemplate or meditate on or think about too much. Every morning when I get up, the first thing I say is a few prayers I made up to the Lord. And I say, Lord, give me perseverance today. It's healthy, you know, that I'm, I'm so weak I might fall here or there. That's okay. But it should not be an obsession. It should not be a point of meditation on yourself. It should not be a unhealthy fear. After you ask for perseverance, then just go about the rest of your day loving Jesus, loving your neighbor, trying to be compassionate and forgiving and forgetting. Try to do all these things. To try to, to just give Jesus consolation. And if you have a church that's open, go before the Blessed Sacrament. Let me tell you all something. Because things are getting so bad everywhere. There's so many heresies and bad teachings and cults in the church, in many Christian churches. And everybody's getting kind of scared, like, what is going on? Let me tell you the secret of persevering. Have love and devotion and real faith in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. That's number one. The second is have great faith and confidence and the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. If you do those two things, that's all. Of course, you go to Mass and everything, but if you're in your heart, those devotions and love are very deep. You can forget all your fears. You can forget everything else. He will protect you and never let you go. But if you start running after this Antichrist and that Antichrist and this false prophet and that false prophet, you're going to fall. You're going to fall. So you do those two things, you won't need to worry. We have another call. Hello? Hello, uh, Mother. Yes. We're, I'm from Baton Rouge, uh -huh. Louisiana, and we love you very much. Thank and you. And we're so fortunate to have you. Um, I confided in a friend once, and I, I thought she was a good, good friend. And, and, you know, in my heart, she was my best friend because mm -hmm. I don't have many friends. And she's also a co-worker, and I found out that she told some people about the things that I had confided mm -hmm. in her. And my fear is, uh, Mother, that um, if I tell her the things again, because I build up my trust in her, and I, I try to... Um, talk to her and be friends because you know we do need someone to talk to sometimes yeah. and and my fear is is that she does this to me again because I was very hurt it's, it's awfully hard I know to trust a friend after they betray you betray a, a consul see but you have a friend in Jesus you can tell him everything and anything he never he never betrays you. There's also that wonderful sacrament of confession. We call it now reconciliation. You need to find yourself a good confessor, a confessor who will listen and be patient. Look around. God will send you somebody and confide your problems in the, and then he, he can give you absolution for that because we all sin in some way and then you have the seal of confession on these things you just have to get off your chest confession is really a sacrament for sin but many confessors are spiritual directors and that's what you need and sometimes you want to tell you want to get something go to Jesus I can guarantee you it works you can tell them there, and there again, you need to go to your church 
before the Blessed Sacrament. He is the great healer. There, there is no remedy better than just sitting before the Blessed We have, our chapel has been designated Shrine of the Holy Eucharist, Shrine of the Blessed Sacrament. And we get people here that come for a couple of days at a time. And everybody says they just sit in the chapel. Some of them don't even say anything. But they have such a healing. You do that. Then forgive the friend that offended you. That's another thing. Because if you don't, you add hurt upon hurt. We have another call. Hello? Good evening, Mother. Good evening. This is Mary Ann Basek from Brookfield, Illinois. Yeah. And I want you to know that I even bought my own television set and had it connected to cable so I could watch your show. Praise because God. Because my husband always has the ball games on. <laughs> <laughs> so now I can watch you all I want. And um, my fear is tonight in Chicago on a major program at dinner time called Entertainment Tonight, they featured all these soap operas and emphasized the fact that the main point of these programs, the soap operas, is to show older women in love and in bed and married to men who are young enough to be their sons. It even showed uh, cameos of feature scenes which turned my stomach and besides that they interviewed the stars <coughs> one of whom had the nerve to say that there is not a woman who wishes that she could be in bed with one of these young studs and the fear I have is the influence all of these programs have on our society and especially on our young people and children, because right. they are allowed to be shown as late as 3.30 in the afternoon. And You're absolutely right. It's, um, there are many things in the world today that I don't think any intelligent, faith-filled human being can understand. You see, all these feminists are already destroyed by their own feminism. See, they, they, they put themselves up as prostitutes. They put up all women wishing they were prostitutes. See, the, the, a country that does that and a film industry that continues, they blaspheme God, they, they put on that, that insults a woman's intelligence. Never has have women been so humiliated as by the feminists and so downtrodden by these so-called uh, uh, Hollywood producers who raise up for feminism, but they destroy women look on television and soap operas like a bunch of prostitutes, adulterers and fornicators. Now, is that your idea of a woman? Is that your idea of raising up a woman? Women have never been so degraded as they are by feminists who, who want to destroy God and destroy his church. By Hollywood producers who produce to make every woman look at her worst. And then have the gall to say that every other woman is like that. This is a strange world we live in. Equality in sex. Well, why don't you go out and be an animal? It's what you look like. That's what you act like. See, this, this feminist business, this holding up women to what? Yeah. Television has done more harm and, and films. They have taken away the whole moral fiber of the country. That's why this network struggles to keep on going. <coughs> you never leave a television program that you don't somehow feel dirty inside. You can't even watch the ads. 
Yeah, you're right. Even the cartoons are tainted with violence and evil. As a nation of Christians, we should kneel every night and say, Lord, have mercy on this country. We have lost our way. We have no concept of God or fear of the Lord. If I were a parent, I would object strenuously to sex education in first and second grade and all of, I'll teach my kids the facts of life. They don't need to start when they're in the first and second grade. Now isn't that demoralizing? We act as if that was the only thing worthwhile in the world. We've taken all the beauty of God's purpose out of it. Yeah, we're a nation that needs much prayer. Whatever you look at, whatever you read, is registered in your memory like a computer. Just like a computer. Be careful what you read. Be careful what you look at. Pray. Go to Jesus in the Eucharist and ask Our Lady to preserve your purity of mind and heart. If you want to get up there, you're going to have to do that. Pray for all the film people to somehow they get their act really together. And they realize the great harm. See, all you people in film, every child that strays because you've made a rotten film, you're going to have to answer for that. So, oh boy, you sound like pre-Vatican spirituality. Well, look, sweetheart, there's nothing wrong with it then, and there's nothing wrong with it now, and what you all need is some pre-Vatican spirituality. Wouldn't hurt a priest at all to speak a little bit about hell. And sin on television. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Where are you from? Yes, I'm from New York. Good. I'd like to thank God for your program. It me. made me feel awful good a lot of times at night just sitting here watching you. Thank you. My, my main fear is that uh, I won't get my family back together. Uh, my wife and I are going through divorce, and uh, the papers are all signed, but she just doesn't seem to know what she wants. I, I go to church on a regular basis. I pray every night, talk to God. I read the Bible every morning, but I just don't seem to get many answers. I just don't know where to go anymore. Well, I know what that means. I remember the day my mother went to court to get a divorce from my father, scared to death. I hid behind a, a ice box, you know, they didn't have freezer refrigeration all day. When my grandfather came home, he kept looking for me. I was so afraid at six years old that my father would get me. And I kept hiding behind the ice box. And he kept saying, Rita, Rita, where are you? And I was going to stay there forever. And finally he caught on, you know, and he said, the judge gave you to your mother. I ran out from behind that ass box. It's a terrible, painful day. I feel for you. And I feel for your family. What you're doing is the best thing you can do. Great things are wrought through prayer. And right now, we're all, there's a lot of us here tonight, we're all going to pray for you. Come on, let's say Hail Mary for him. Hail Mary, Hail Mary full of grace, grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Our Lady help a Christian. Pray for us. We have another call. Hello? 
Hello? Somebody better come in before I choke. <laughs> Who wants to ask something here? Anybody? Anybody have a question? Well, you're an attentive audience, I tell you that. Nobody has a question. Okay, we're ready for a call. Hello? Hello, Mother Angelica? Yes. I'm calling from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And there are three fears that come into play with an event that happened on Friday. That Wait, would but like would you talk a little louder, please? Yes. As of Friday, uh, I ran into an event that brought up three fears. The event centered around a couple who approached me trying to seek advice and help on what to do about having had an abortion, where the wife had had an abortion. This was two people, mother, who realized that they have murdered their child. Right. And they were asking me what it was that they should do or could do. It seemed from talking with them that their fear of being responsible <clears throat> led them to the murder. And then now they're facing not only guilt over that, but fear over their salvation. But in listening to what they have as a concept of God, these are people for whom Jesus is not real. Yeah. They are people who don't have the fullness of the sacrament. And I gave them a Chaplet of Divine Mercy card suggesting that they please pray that prayer. I passed on advice I had heard you give on an earlier program to pray for intercessory forgiveness and mercy right. to the soul of the child. Right. And I, was I, think, I think what you need to do, all of those of you who are listening to me tonight, who have had an abortion, or one, or two, or three abortions, you are not, I repeat, you are not beyond the mercy of God. What you do, kneel down now in your living room, in your bedroom, and just say, Jesus, I'm heartily sorry for having committed an abortion. I trust you. I love you. I ask that you bestow upon me your forgiving power. I ask that you bestow upon the child that I did away with the joy of thy heavenly kingdom. I ask for the grace never to offend thee again in this manner. I trust in your infinite mercy. Grant me the grace to go to any woman that I know is about to commit an abortion and give her courage and strength and help her all I can. When thoughts of guilt come back to you, say a simple prayer from your heart. God is infinite compassion. He said to the adulterers, has anyone condemned thee? He said, no, Lord, neither will I. Go and sin no more. Don't allow yourself to suffer from despair. That's not right. Give yourself the joy of experiencing in your heart the mercy of God. You know, we put up on our grounds here a little a gravestone of an, all the aborted children. So you have a little grave there and there's a stone for all the aborted children in the world. And one day we found a note on this grave 
and it said, Michael, I'm very sorry, Mother. You see, give God the joy of saying, I forgive you. Go and sin no more. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Yes. This is Genevieve from Springfield, Massachusetts. Okay. My fear is that I don't love God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit in quite the right way. Yeah. For instance, I can hear you speak of your love for Jesus, and it's so warm, it's so personal. Yeah. I, I know that I love him, and I, I want to be with him one day. But to me, I feel there's something lacking. Well, let's see. I don't love God with emotion. I mean, I look, do I, look, I look like that? Do I look like that? No, I don't look like that. I love God with deep faith. I know he is. I know he loves me because I'm a pretty nasty kid. And I didn't know him at all until I was 18. I could care less. I was busy surviving. But he just picked me up, you know, and he said, boy, if I don't do something with this kid, it's going to be pretty bad. And he raised me up, and he healed me, and he made me know. I, I'm grateful, see? I'm so great. I know exactly where I'd be today if it wasn't for Jesus. And I love him, but I don't know I love him. Do you think I love Jesus? Yeah? See, I don't know as much as they know. <laughs> I just keep plugging along. See, I try to do his will every moment. I try to accept whatever comes, whatever pain or suffering, fear, whatever comes along. That's all I do. And I want you to love Jesus. I really do. But I don't think you ought to worry about how much you love Jesus. You see, Jesus never loved the Father as much as he did on the cross, did he, huh? He accepted his Father, I into thy hands I commend my spirit. Father, I have accomplished the work you've given me to do. See, all the time he was so in pain, terrible pain. But you see, the feelings were not there, were they, huh? But he kept saying it. See, he kept saying it. So that's okay. Don't worry if you don't know where you are, how much you love you. Every moment, forget what you did or didn't do yesterday. Every moment. And when you goof, just go up to him and say, I goofed. I'm sorry, Lord. I didn't mean it. Help me to be better next time. I don't think holiness is very uh, hard. I think you need to love much. Love God and love your neighbor. And even when you don't think you're loving God, that's probably the time you love him the most. See? <laughs> I don't know if I attempt to tell you this. I'll hurry up. I was called for adoration at 3 o'clock in the morning when I was a young sister. I had a migraine headache. I had an ingrown toenail. <laughs> and my back was killing me. And Reverend Mother said, my Sister Angelica, 3 o'clock. And I got so mad, and I said, Lord, what do you think I am, a horse? <laughs> and, and I went to bed grouchy, you know, because somebody's going to rap at my door at 3 o'clock. And so I went down to the chapel. My headache was gone. My, my ingrown tail you know, that didn't hurt me. My back didn't hurt me. I felt so humiliated. I felt so guilty. I looked at the Lord. I said, Lord, you know, forget it. We, I didn't mean it. And if you can't give me something to suffer for souls, who are you going to give it to? Pow! My headache came back. <laughs> <laughs> my ingrown toenail was killing me. My back, oh. I said, thanks, Lord. <laughs> the quickest prayer ever got answered. <laughs> Why did I bring that up? What was she talking about? Do you remember? I don't remember either. Anyway, I love you. And I'll see you tomorrow night, hoping with a better voice. But thanks for putting up with me tonight. Remember. I don't usually ask on Tuesday night. 
but I do need your contribution. Write to Mother Angelica, Irondale, Alabama, 35210. Bye now, and love Jesus. Mwah.